Twin Oaks because it's like this community that I feel like has been in the, we've heard about it. It's all like on the internet. You guys do a lot with the uh, communities conference and the Facebook groups and stuff like that. So I'm like so excited. I've never actually had an in-depth conversation with somebody who lives there. So that's really exciting. But we thought as a starting point, uh, if you want to talk about like your journey and like how, what brought you there and what brought you towards like intentional community and everything like that would be a cool way to, to introduce you. Sure. All right. So I'm Jules. I've lived at Twin Oaks for almost six years now. And I had been coming around for a while before that. Basically, um, after a traumatic experience in college, I uh, dropped out and I needed something to do and I didn't have money. And I had heard about Twin Oaks originally from a member here, Paxis came to my high school, actually. It was wow. not the kind of groovy high school that you would think would host uh, Twin Oaks, but there was one teacher who'd been there for forever. He taught a utopian literature elective, and he decided to bring Twin Oakers. And so then I'd had some friends who came to Twin Oaks, uh, and I heard about it through them and decided during my unexpected gap year in college that I wanted to try out community. And so I decided to go to Twin Oaks and see how it felt. Uh, and I kind of fell in love with the community then. And that was uh, nine, nine, almost 10 years ago. It was uh, in October of 2014. Uh, and I've kind wow. of been in love with Twin Oaks ever since. Um, then I went back to school. I finished my bachelor's degree. Uh, and I actually did my undergraduate thesis research on Twin Oaks specifically in sociology, specifically on how our labor system um, gives compensation, equal compensation for domestic labor, like cooking and cleaning and childcare that women usually do within the home for free and how that changes gender roles. Um, and in the process of doing my research, I fell even deeper in love with the community and I decided that I had to move here. I moved here thinking I was going to stay for a year or two, but honestly, 2020 happened, uh, the pandemic happened, and I saw how great my food security was, that I had such great access to my friends. Um, and so currently, I'm still happy here. Uh, I have plans to like leave and travel and come back, but I don't really have any plans of leaving at this point. Um, wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's so about awesome. the broad summary of my Twitter journey. <laughs> That's wild. I didn't know Paxis lived out of Facebook. I thought his outreach was solely Facebook. So <laughs> cool to hear that he's going to high school. Yeah, they, there's That's like a wild. Facebook enigma for us. We're like, who is Paxis? <laughs> <laughs> Another person we really should talk to. Paxis is omnipresent. One day I was like actually driving up to Twin Oaks from college while I was working on my research, listening to like an old This American Life episode. And I had this guy is like talking about this like thing that he was doing with anti-nuclear activism in the 90s. And he goes, my friend Paxis. And I go, hold <laughs> up. <laughs> There's only one Paxis in this world, I swear. <laughs> That's and he lives in Twin Oaks. <laughs> Does does he still teach at that same school or that was in the oh, past? He, he doesn't teach. Um, so he's okay. done. Okay. That various Twin Oakers okay. have done something. Yeah, sorry. Various Twin Oakers have done something called Toast Tours, uh, Twin Oaks Academic Speaking Tour, where basically uh, schools will pay Twin Oakers to come talk about communes and what it's like living on communes. Um, and it's mostly been at colleges, but there have been a few high schoolers, high schools where we've done it as well. Cool. Wow, well, I thought schools were trying to get kids to stop smoking weed, not to stop. No, 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 that's a that's a bad that's a bad image. I'm just joking. But that's wild. That's so cool. I I could never imagine something like that happening. That's so cool. Fuck yeah. It's cool also because it's like I feel like there's surprisingly little research. I mean, there is a lot of research on intentional communities, but there's such a good like study group for like sociological concepts and things like that. And like you're saying, like observing like slight changes in, you know, your routine and how that affects like the whole social landscape and everything. And um, it is like, it's, there's so much more research that could be done. I feel like, and it's, I feel like even lucky that we know about it now. Cause I'd be like, how are people not like studying these groups even on a deeper level, you know? Mm -hmm. um, totally. So that's your thesis, wait, can you speak a little more specific? Like your thesis was about the how 
the lifestyle and the intentional community altered the gender role? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So specifically, Twin Oaks has a labor system that basically operates on like a work quota. So all members are expected to do 42 hours a week, though we have various uh, various things that are considered work here, that, many things that are considered work here that would not be considered work uh, in a sort of like standard mainstream life. Um, and so one of those things among others, including like you get labor credits for going to, uh, like you get hour per hour for every job you do. Um, and you get labor credits for say going to therapy, which is pretty great. Um, or, and we all, get, we get sick hours if we are sick, uh, stuff like that. Like I've been taking sick hours while I've been recovering from top surgery. Um, and so, yeah. Basically, one of the greatest things that we do labor credits for are things like cooking and cleaning and childcare. Um, and a lot of that is work that, yes, is sometimes shared within a household, but especially in terms of like, like there's all this discourse on TikTok right now about mental load and about what that the mental load of domestic labor is. And that typically, even as like husbands are sharing in like a hetero nuclear family, are like sharing in that labor, they're still requiring a lot of the mental load to be put on women. And what's really cool here is that because we give labor credits for all of that work, that is work that like, it is still, I think that there are more men here doing that kind of work than there would be uh, in the mainstream or that's more hours for parents and fathers and men. Um, but in general, you basically have like still more women doing that because there hasn't been nearly as much of a push of like introducing men to traditionally feminized tasks as there has been for introducing women to traditionally masculinized tasks. There's been a lot more focus on that. But like even as women are still doing more of that work, they are also getting compensated for that, which makes right. such a big difference. Um, you know, a typical family, nuclear family today has two partners, uh, usually a man and a woman and they usually both work full time and then they have kids and uh usually the wife is doing significantly more labor and that is simply not the case here and so i thought that, that was pretty cool yeah but it gives a lot more room for freedom of gender um, we have a lot of trans people here as well um, and that didn't factor into my research nearly as much because it's much harder to find sort of like mainstream data to compare it to but yeah, I think Twin Oaks provides a much greater space for gender diversity, both like within the binary genders and outside of it. Wow. Yeah. First of all, so cool that with the therapy like that, because self-work is also something that it's like a benefit to the whole community, you know, and so yes. it makes complete <laughs> sense to be like, hey, good job doing the work. Like you get credit for that. Um, and yeah, that's actually that's so because that's something I've been thinking a lot about recently is like I, you know, women being encouraged to do more masculine tasks. And like I uh, started really getting into like construction and things like that. Right. And now that I'm pregnant, I'm like, hmm, OK, well, I still got to carry the baby. But it's a little harder to do construction now. And like it almost makes sense that like, OK, like it would actually be easier probably to like cook and do, but then like be pregnant and like tree cook, you know. And so it's just like interesting how to balance that. It's not so much about, you know, now a woman does everything, you know, but like right. balancing it back and forth and stuff. Um, and like, yeah, there's a more like intricate look. So that's so cool that, that you're doing that uh, study on like the complexities of gender roles. Cause it's not just like, yeah, a simple answer of like, now do it. So these credits though, like well, absolutely. What, what, what can, what can you, what are these credits? Like, what can I do with them? So basically, uh, we're all expected to work uh, 42 hours a week. And it, every single job, whether it's like uh, accounting or working in the dairy, is an hour per hour. Uh, with the exception of uh, child care for a single child, which I actually think is one of the source, greater sources of gender inequity in community, where like if you're caring for a single child, or at Twin Oaks at least, where you're caring for a single child that's actually half labor creditable, um, which I kind of think is bogus, but uh, basically, so we're all doing all of that. And those go into our, we have a database of all of the numbers of all of the different kinds of work that's been done, which is one of the reasons that I think Twin Oaks is one of the easiest places to study is that there's this vast amount of quantitative data as well as qualitative data available. Um, 
but you can also like if you work more than 42 hours in one week, uh, then you get to take those hours as vacation later and you can sort of build up a vacation balance. And so there are people here who will work like 45 hour weeks basically all year long and then take like a month and a half of vacation because we all also get basically three weeks paid vacation um, for turning in our labor sheets on time. And paid like in uh, like currency, like um, U.S. dollar? No, or paid, no? In, paid in labor credits as in basically gotcha. you're, you're still a member. You still get the benefits of membership. You're still getting your stipend, which is low, uh, but also like all of our needs are met. Um, uh-huh. Honestly, uh-huh. I feel like it's not, it's not so different from say, I don't know, working at like working at a mainstream job, paying rent, paying for healthcare, paying for groceries. It's just that basically all of your basic needs are met in community. And then you have a stipend for disposable income. And like some people will have significantly more than uh, like 125, 115, I think it's 115 right now, dollars per month uh, of disposable income. But I think a lot of us would not. Uh, mm-hmm. I certainly wouldn't. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. And I actually work primarily. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was, I was just curious about, um, so it's like your needs are met, right? Like you have a a housing situation. Does everybody have Mm -hmm. a private housing situation or is it shared? And how is that determined? Like everybody has a private room um, and it's all in a shared house, right? All in shared houses. So we have, uh, I, Technically, we have nine SLGs, which is small living groups, uh, but actually it's in seven houses. Uh, two of two houses, including the one that I live in, are split like by floor, essentially. Um, and the small living group makes decisions about like household norms um, in terms of like, when should you not be blasting music or like, uh, I don't know, stuff about cleaning, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, every single member has a room. Um, couples, each member of that couple will have a room. Um, and oftentimes you'll sort of like, one of those rooms is either treated as a living room or like storage and the, the couple will live in the other room. But that has been very important because, you know, when there's a breakup, you don't want to suddenly have to be yeah. like, oh shoot, we need to find somebody a room instead yeah. of it's already provided. Right, right, right. And mm-hmm. uh, let's say like, so, and is it all off grid Twin Oaks? Like, no. Um, okay. So awesome. we are, we have a decent amount of solar, but it is grid tied solar. So that actually gets sold back to the power company. Um, we are fully on grid. Um, we often get called an eco village and I'm not sure if that characterization is entirely accurate. Um, it is not our primary focus. However, by virtue of sharing the vast majority of our things, we are already contributing a whole lot less to pollution, carbon emissions, stuff like that. I mean, even just like, like, for example, we have a fleet of, I want to say 17 shared vehicles. Um, some of those are like cargo vans. Some of those are Priuses. I uh, cool. got a minivan, a couple trucks. Um, and like, instead of every single person having their own car, having this shared set of cars that you can sign out uh, is already a great impact or the fact that we're only feeding, we're feeding seven houses instead of like 90 houses. Right. Um, Right. Stuff like that. I think makes a really big difference. For sure. Yeah. 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 I don't think you have to uh, be off grid necessarily to be environmentally focused and everything. But um, I was, I was like starting to think about, I had an example of like, okay, but then I was like, maybe they don't have it. But I was like, let's say, like, if your uh, plumbing was leaking in your house, um, is that a job that somebody in the community would do? And then you yeah. would like, so like things like that, you would like submit a, a request and then somebody would come and like, so people work jobs like that kind of? Yeah, I mean, so basically if, if there were a plumbing issue, uh, I would contact McCune. And I'd be like, hey, McCune, uh, the upstairs O toilet isn't flushing. You know, I turned off the water at the source, uh, but I needed to come up here. And he would, within the day or two, uh, come up and fix it. Cool. Um, and, 
And that would be free because that's like a within like that's part of right. your housing being met is that the community provides the labor to like repair things and everything like that kind of. So that's cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. That is that is just automatically like there are baseline assumptions about like quality of life stuff mm -hmm. uh, and all of that is met. Mm hmm. Cool. Yeah. I'm just thinking about like how the, the jobs work. And then, so is there somebody that uh, is like keeping track of everyone else uh, doing like they're making sure they're doing their 42 hours. And is that a job that anyone can just volunteer for? Is that somebody that is appointed in some way? So there's, uh, there's actually a full labor team. Um, basically that's primarily, so there's a labor manager um, who is responsible fundamentally for sort of like making sure, keeping track of people's labor, uh, just making sure that people are turning in their sheets on time. But then you also have labor assigners. Um, I wish I had mine at my desk. I don't. Uh, but basically, we get a labor sheet uh, that will have uh, your various tasks for the week assigned um and what that will look like uh, like some of them are people self-assigning or you just sort of fill in but some of them are jobs that sort of have to happen within a set period of time on a given day and so for example like i one of my favorite jobs in community is cooking dinner for the whole community um and that's a five-hour shift every saturday afternoon i'm cooking dinner um and then i'll have two helpers assigned um and we make a really big fancy fun meal and it's a great time um, but basically that's one of those things where like, we need somebody to keep track of assigning those to make sure that they actually happen. Right. I, I like to refer to us as like the bureaucratic hippies. Like we are the most, by far the most sort of like structured commune of any of the ones that I have interacted with. Um, but also we are so bureaucratic specifically in order to maintain as much egalitarianism as possible. Um, for the labor manager, that's going to be uh, a job that the person uh, signs, like, if, say the labor manager job is open, there will be a card posted, uh, somebody will sign that card as like, I'm willing to do it, or a couple people will sign that card. And then there will be a community input process. Um, and either like the outgoing labor manager, or more likely, like, the council of sort of similar managerships. So like, stuff like the econ team and such. Uh, will open that input box, read the input, and then make a decision based on community input. Nice. And so for someone... It's all who, very... <laughs> yeah. No, that's cool. And, you know, that's the thing. Like, that's why it's an intentional community. Like, we're all trying to find, like, what works for us, you know? Like, I'm personally mm -hmm. a messy person. And so, like, to be in that, like, messy, la messy vibe, like, I like that. You know what I mean? It works for me. And for other people, it's different. But so for someone who's like, you know, you know, completely may, may not even know what egalitarian and, you know, community is. Could you like give an overview of what that is and how that works in, in Twin Oaks? Oh, absolutely. So uh, egalitarianism. If you ask uh, all like I think we're currently our population is at 79 adult members if you ask all 79 Twin Oakers what egalitarianism means you're probably going to get 79 different answers uh, but the sort of bare bones basics of it is that we try to be as equal as possible um, and to do as much as possible to sort of like cancel out uh, like power differentials both within the community and also the sort of power differentials that we bring from the outside so like you know you're going to have, uh, like, for example, gender, right? Uh, like there is automatically a power differential from the mainstream that we're bringing in, in terms of like men versus women, right? And our power, the way that our system works, we are very careful to try to fix those imbalances as best as we can. We don't always succeed there. We are still sort of carrying our cultural baggage in with us, right? But like, for example, having a focus on encouraging, like teaching women how to do auto work, how to do construction. That has been one of the ways that we've tried to fix gender imbalance, gender-based power imbalances. Um, to me, I think egalitarianism is a process more so than like an end state in the same way as I think of utopia as a process, right? Like there is no state, I. I don't think in this world or this lifetime 
there is such a thing as a situation which is 100% completely equal for everybody and everybody has exactly equal. But we do our best. Um, I think our biggest failings in terms of egalitarianism often come with the fact that like jobs that require a high level of responsibility are highly undesirable here. And that those jobs that require a high level of responsibility are more likely to have a high level of power. And the reason that they're undesirable is that they're not compensated more. Like it's all an hour for hour, even if you're like making big decisions, um, which is very different from like a corporation. Um, but that also means that certain people who have the expertise to do those jobs do still have more power or more say over those situations. And like, yes, there is always here, like we have right of appeal system where basically any managerial decision, any decision that happens can be appealed. And uh, if two thirds of the community signs your appeal position, petition, uh, like even like, right, even the highest level of decision can be overturned by that. Um, but at the same time, that requires a high degree of like energy put into it uh, and people don't want to make conflict. And so sometimes you just have to live with decisions that you don't really like or or basically you, you choose your battles. Right. You decide, like, do I really want to fight this or am I just going to accept this as this is the decision? Right. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's I like that uh, describing it as a, a process because that's something like, you know, it's like we claim to be egalitarian, but it's like there's constantly mm -hmm. like un like things you can't avoid or just things from where we come from or our backgrounds or our situations or the, the social dynamics that create uh, power imbalances at certain points. And you just have to figure out how to compensate for them or recognize them and talk about them and, you know, um, and it's it's interesting, like we've we've mostly only lived in very structureless uh, kinds of, you know, mm -hmm. so but I've seen also how, yeah, sometimes I think creating even though those roles, it's like, oh, but in this community, you have a specific role for this thing that has this more power. But in that way, you kind of acknowledge a role that needs to be done and you're able to more like uh, yeah, create structure around it to keep it in check rather than it just being. Um, kind of like a free for all and you know what I mean and harder to point out and harder to see and harder to understand as like a um, what's happening you know um, so that exactly. makes sense. yeah I, I think that our systems more more often than not contribute greater levels of egalitarianism rather than lesser even even the ways that we set up like people being in charge of certain things I think are still designed to create as much egalitarianism as possible versus like I've absolutely been to communities that have a lot less structure and then have a lot more sort of like power accumulation among a couple individuals because of that I'm not saying that like all unstructured communities are going to be like that uh, mm -hmm. each community has their own things that work for them but that is something that I've noticed for us at least having more sort of like rules and agreements contributes to a greater level of egalitarianism rather than a lesser one. Um, I don't know if either of y'all have read the book The Dispossessed by Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, it is uh, honestly the best description of Twin Oaks that I've ever read. It is not about Twin Oaks. However, okay, it, yeah. um, it's about like a, <laughs> a fictional anarchist moon uh, that had like an anarchist colony on a moon. Um, and it really sums up where they're very, very careful about making sure that nobody has any greater level of power. Uh, but it still also explains how by creating these systems, uh, you still have people who, based on sort of like seniority, have a certain level of knowledge that then makes them, gives them that level of power. Um, I think if anybody wants to understand, like, the problems with Twin Oaks, that that is the book that I will always send them to, even though it's entirely fictional. I'm like, did Ursula Le Guin secretly live in community for 30 years? Because that's, <laughs> that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, we were saying before too, it's just, it's always so, uh, like reassuring to talk to other communities. Cause I'm like, oh, okay, cool. It's not just us. It's like literally these things just happen. Oh, yeah. And it's just like, uh, it, the similarities are, are really, yeah. 
I was thinking that totally. too. Like, and it's interesting. Oh, oh, sorry, you go. Oh, just that Twin Oaks is actually a part of an organization <laughs> called the Federation of Egalitarian Communities that is a group of currently really four sort of full member and active communities um, that all have similar commitments to like income sharing and to being as equal as possible. Um, and we're able to do like labor exchange between our communities. So like Twin Oakers can go out to Eastland uh, in Missouri and uh, trade our labor with them and we get ours in our community and then Eastlanders can come here and do the same thing. Um, and I think that that's cool. a pretty cool thing that we have as an organization. Yeah, cross-pollination. And with that, you get health insurance? Uh, sort of. Okay, it's not It's not insurance. That is very legally important that it is not insurance. It <laughs> okay. is essentially a shared catastrophic health savings plan. Uh, so we all sort of pay in, uh, I want to say $15 per member per month, maybe it's 10 um, Each community who is a part of that organization is called Peach. Uh, don't ask me what it stands for. Uh, it's got a <laughs> ton of acronyms and none of them really quite make sense. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Laird from Sand Hill in the 80s. Uh, <laughs> essentially, we all pay in and then anytime a member has a health need uh, that costs more than $5,000, uh, Peach will pay out to that community what is in excess of that $5,000. And by pooling all of that money together and sharing that and investing it together in like socially responsible mutual funds, you're able to all have greater access to funds uh, than we would in each community on its own. That's cool. That's it's like t technically like your own insurance setup of just like, yeah, we'll just manage it ourselves kind of like. Right. Not insurance, but health savings. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But it's like, you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like an autonomous one, kind of, almost. Like, it's exactly, not part of a right. company, but you're doing the same concept, just, like, amongst each other, in a way, of, like, yeah. I know I'll be pre prepared for, and hopefully, yeah. That's cool. Exactly. I think it's one of the greatest ways that we've done mutual aid as an organization, the FEC, uh, is by doing this process. That's cool. That, that'll be a good, uh, for, we have, get so many comments like, what about health insurance? And like, we have, we're never been part of a community that's figured that out. So that's cool. Um, to, right. uh, to show people that it is possible to have health insurance in an intentional community. Um, do you think like you, for some reason that you hate to go to the hospital or you hate doctors, you hate traditional medicine. Yeah. Uh, like, I don't know where these yeah. concepts come from, but I guess some, but that's one of the main things people get afraid of if they, you know, why they keep their jobs or what, you know, what about health insurance? What, you know, how, what do you do about that? And so, um, oh, totally. I mean, most places you could just show up and you can get it for free, you know, if you just know what you're doing, but, um, that's a whole other episode. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, like, I thought maybe we could. So I was thinking, OK, in a way, like when we have the this is kind of back to what we were talking about before uh, health policies. But um, like we appointed roles to like on a large scale, that the kind of roles and breakdown that you need to have in an intentional community in order to just operate. Um, it's like what separates then it's kind of like just a small scale democracy that you know because we were just talking to somebody from Damanhur the other day uh and they have you know little groups and then spokespersons i'm like okay this is actually just a small scale of kind of very similar to like how a democracy is set up but maybe it's just at a small enough scale that people actually feel spoken for um you know and yeah, I just and they that. have like electoral things and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, what's the process? I know you were saying like there's managed, but is there like a community meeting or is there too many people for that? Or like, what's the like if a decisions are getting made, how does that look? I know you were saying about the appeal. Sure. Yeah, Twin Oaks' processes on this are kind of funny, and I don't necessarily think that they're ideal. I think in a lot of ways, I kind of prefer East Wind's direct democracy approach um at least on decision making processes but essentially like we do have community meetings um but there's been a very firm norm for a very long period of time that decisions are not actually made in the meeting which to me is stupid i don't like that but <laughs> that is how that is set up um 
if there is like a small decision, for example, what color are we going to paint the walls in the new food processing kitchen? Uh, the manager will make that decision, right? And if somebody really has an issue with it, then they can go repaint it themselves on their own time. Um, <laughs> but like, right, as small decisions like that, or like, for example, like um, which variety of carrots are we going to plant next year? Um, like there's going to be, there's actually like a meeting among the garden crew and the garden crew will make that decision. Though any concerned or interested members of the community can show up to that crop review meeting and give their input on that. Um, and so those those small decisions are going to be made by an individual or a small group of people who are the most relevant stakeholders. Because, um, you know, as much as I'm like, I love the Danvers carrots from Southern Exposure, uh, like if Danvers carrots are really annoying to plant, which they're not, they're actually great. Um, then if the garden feels like they don't want to plant them, that's fine. They get mm -hmm, to make that mm -hmm. choice because I'm cooking with them, but I'm not the one growing them. Mm -hmm. um, but then if you have like a, a larger decision, um, then that is going to be made usually via community input and then either by a manager or by the council of like related managers. Um, and then our biggest decisions are made by uh, people called the planners who essentially do uh, 18 month terms, 18 month or less terms uh, of making the biggest decisions in community. The vast majority of planner decisions have community input. Um, and so really a lot of it, a lot of those decisions are made based on what people have to say. Uh, but there's going to be a group of people who are responsible for actually sifting through that. And we don't do 100% direct democracy in terms of like it is the majority rules. If there's a significant portion of concerns about something, then what that typically looks like is not it not passing completely entirely. It's not like it like vanishes or disappears. It's also not, well, the majority of people feel strongly this way, so we're just going to go with that. It's instead, okay, actually, we're going to go back and we're going to see what we can do to potentially address those concerns and move forward. I kind of think it as, of it as sort of like uh, the like imperfect baby of democracy and consensus, the way that we operate. Um, but it is fairly effective. And in general, like large community decisions, typically most people feel satisfied at the end of that process, which is a really hard thing to do. Uh, yeah. 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 At least like heard and yeah, I know. Cause also, you know, mm -hmm. well, yeah, there's, you know, we've gone a lot by, you know, a hundred percent consensus and then there's also people that just get frustrated with how much time that takes and then they're not happy anyways, even if they are being heard, you know? And so, yeah, it's a, uh, there's, right. there's, there's yeah. benefits to every system you can do. Yeah. I like the kind of, like oh, sorry. No, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say when you were saying like small scale decisions, kind of like the doer decides, like the concept of duocracy is something that we learned about before a project we did this year. And, uh, kind of tried to like implement it but then it got like misinterpreted and like went crazy where everyone was like do or decides I'm just gonna do it I'm just, like whatever and I was like no like, that's a that means, like, you just do it and like we were like no like but whatever Not but quite. it makes sense of like yeah like the person that yeah as, even though you like those carrots somebody that's actually doing it has more you know uh power in that decision and that is just like a respect thing not like a, a power imbalance and that's yeah um Exactly. Right. It's about weighting the input of the like most affected stakeholders highest. And right. I think that that's kind of a pretty cool thing. Um, I did a term as a planner. Um, I did four months in uh, from November of 2020 through February of 2021. So the peak of like pre vaccine COVID. Uh, and everybody was. It was the, the most stressful experience. I would say, like, I was one of the most powerful people in the community by our sort of, like, set of norms. However, uh, it should explain a lot, I think, about how Twin Oaks does egalitarianism for me to say that I, uh, I will never do that job again. <laughs> and the vast majority of people who finish their planner terms are like, never again. Like, I don't know if anybody has been 
anybody in the community, even people who've lived here for like 40 years, has been a planner twice. <laughs> Are you saying planter or planner? No, sorry, planner. Planner. Okay, okay, that's what I was thinking. Like planner, creating like yeah. your plans. Is that like so the planners are essentially the board of directors of the community, but I often they're often referred to as basically like the Twin Oaks Supreme Court. Like right. the vast majority of decisions are going to be made at the managerial level. Uh, mm -hmm. That is like we don't want decisions to have to come as high up as the planners unless they are either really serious or really contentious. Um, and so planners will make decisions like unfortunately under uh, in like peak. COVID times, we were making a lot of decisions about our sort of community-wide, uh, like, household quarantine, essentially. Like, we all, we were all essentially one bubble, one household, which was really great because it meant that, like, during even the tightest of lockdown, we all got, so, like, I had a birthday party in April of 2020 with, like, 80 of my friends. Wow, um, yeah. And that's not something that could possibly happen uh, at that time elsewhere. But what that meant also is that we had to be really strict and significantly stricter, I think, than the average household in terms of how people interacted outside of the mm -hmm. bubble, because there are people who are immunocompromised here. We had a number of elders um, and still have a number of elders. Um, and in that process, as a planner, unfortunately, a lot of the like COVID related decision making fell on us. And so we were making decisions, for example, about whether a child could go do mandated custody visits with his mother indoors. Um, and that was a really hard decision that we had mm. to make. Um, it's like we're weighting that against, oh, well, this person doesn't necessarily believe in COVID. Uh, this mother doesn't necessarily believe in COVID. And as a community, we have a number of people who are really concerned about it. And so like, how do we handle, like, we want this child to be able to see his mother, both for court mandated reasons and also for, uh, like, just because that's the human thing to do reasons. And then we're also really concerned about avoiding bringing it into the community. Um, it's really great that we are no longer in that lockdown. It was, I think it was tough on everybody, but I also think it was still significantly easier uh, for us in a lot of ways than it was for people who, you know, worked at a grocery store and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, lived with their family in a nuclear family setting. Yeah, I think that is one of the, the greatest things about community. And what makes it also more sustainable, too, is you don't really have to travel anywhere to have all your social needs met and your work and your food and your everything. And, um, yeah, exactly. A really huge benefit. It's it's kind of like, so there's this term of like a total institution, which is basically any institution that includes like your, all of your work, all of your social stuff, all of your like living basics, basically all of it, right? And Twin Oaks is an example of a total institution. Other examples include things like colleges. Um, I don't know, like, uh, I, this is going to sound bad, but like prisons are also a total institution. Right? <laughs> right, it's right, like right. really positive on the one end of like Twin Oaks. Mm -hmm great total institution <laughs> on the other end prisons um uh -huh. but in general i think a lot of people here really enjoy the total institution aspect of it actually that's something that had been difficult for me particularly following like i don't think necessarily like following quarantine uh like it, the total institutionness felt more claustrophobic to me and so i actually i have an outside job um that helps me sort of have Twin Oaks be somewhat less total of an institution while still living here and getting to participate in day-to-day -day life. Um, I work for a state government agency on an invasive insect. Um, and so I'll go out and survey for this bug. Um, I do various communications tasks around the bug. Um, and it's not full-time, but it is a significant portion uh, close to it. And I do that as both as community labor and then as money that I keep for myself. Um, so cool. I do the majority of my hours. I basically I give my pay to Twin Oaks and mm -hmm. uh, that counts as my hours. Um, and then some of those hours, I will keep that money for myself. and I have that in savings and I'm allowed people. Twin Oaks basically are like property code, like our rules around income sharing are that 
uh, if you earn money off the property, uh, you're able to then keep that money and then spend it when you go off the property for more than 24 hours for like a vacation or whatever. And what that does is it's basically meant to keep things as equal as possible in terms of monetary access for the membership, um, which I think is great. Um, and it also allows members that that's how, you know, I have my money to be able to go on vacation, right? Like I'm getting paid in terms of like, like my needs are met. I'm not going to lose my housing. I'm not going to lose my food. I'm going to have all of my things. Like if I had a health emergency outside of the community, the community would cover that. Um, but also that's how I have money to say, I don't know, go drive down to Asheville for the North American Mycological Association annual foray, right? Yeah, right. Or also, yeah, if you wanted to, you know, just uh one day you were like i'm i'm ready to leave twin oaks you could have something exactly. saved up that that was an option for you which is a good, yes. good thing yeah additionally when we join we do not give all of our money to twin oaks <laughs> i think that that's a big thing and honestly i think i feel very nervous of or skeptical of communities that do require members to then give uh all of their money or even to like buy in to membership in that community like i think there are a lot of really cool eco villages that are awesome in what they're doing but i dislike that they basically require members to buy a house there and to have to sort of pay for their membership because you can move to twin oaks with nothing yeah you can also move to twin oaks with like a little bank account full of savings and then essentially you just the expectation is that you are not touching that money and you are not like earning money with that money while you're a member Mm -hmm. um like i'm you can keep the interest and stuff but like if it's like a savings account but we're not you're not like going out and investing it and like becoming a millionaire uh with the like three thousand dollars in your account that you moved here with right um but then you can also save your stipend and you can also save uh any money that you make off the property for leaving and then additionally we offer leaving loans for people. Um, generally, the expectation um, this is not always true, but the expectation is that you've like lived here for two years um, and that you don't really have a lot of access to outside money. Beside, like, And so you really need that money in order to be able to leave. Um, and then Twin Oaks will provide leaving loans up to $3,000, but we have allowed more. Um, $3,000 is our policy set limit, uh, but we will allow more. Uh, in like circumstances where that's really necessary. Cool, that makes sense. What's your thousand dollars for people leaving? Uh, as a loan. Yeah, as a loan. And then they pay it back. Okay, right. right. The extra. Yeah, we can just join like, and leave. We're not, and leave. <laughs> 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 we're not like clawing that money back from people either necessarily. Mm-hmm. Like they're absolutely like, I think most people generally pay back their leaving loans. Um, but the only sort of thing that we're really doing when people have leaving loans. Um, is like if you're not making any payments and you don't have a payment plan on your leaving loan um, after like your first six months, then there's kind of an expectation that you're not really welcome to come back and guest. Whereas otherwise we have ex members come back and uh, stay as guests all the time, Uh, which to me is one of the signs of a really healthy community is that like people come, people go, and they still have a really positive relationship with the community the majority of the time. Yeah, that is, yeah. That is what I so wait, what what book is it that you know? <laughs> Sorry, what what? What what book is it? The invasive insect. Oh, um. <laughs> Sorry, I, I would say, I but I'm not sure fun. if my job would love it. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's so, fine. Okay. I, you don't work for the FBI and you're not working with bugs in no, that no, way. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. I can't talk about. No, no, no. no. I just. <laughs> I don't know if like the particular agency wants to be associated with uh, Twin Oaks as a community. Uh, yeah, they have yeah. very specific sort of rules around like who is allowed to like what employee is allowed to say what on behalf of the agency. And I wouldn't want to be misinterpreted as like speaking for. It's a bug. It, it's not, right. you know, it's an right. environmental job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I, yeah, I'm just curious if it's a stink bug. I'm just curious about stink bugs, so I was trying to figure out if it's a stink bug, but it's not about stink bugs. Okay. Not brown uh, marmorated stink bug. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> 
right. How many people are at Twin Oaks? So we have currently 78 adult members. Um, we have a population capacity of 93. Um, and then we also have, uh, within that, we have a set number of sort of like slots available uh, for like children and families uh, to like move here. Um, and so our, we have currently, I want to say like 14 kids, um, including two who are part-time at Twin Oaks and part-time elsewhere. And then we have actually three uh, who are part-time and then who, you know, have a parent outside of the community and have a parent who lives in the community. Uh, and then we have a sort of ranging cast of like long-term guests, short-term guests and visitors who are doing like visitors are specifically people who are doing a three week visitor program where they get a bunch of orientations, like a structured introduction to the community and where they can apply for membership. I'm curious about the, um, like food sustainability, like how much of your food uh, comes from the farm? Um, so we don't grow, we grow our own vegetables, we grow our own fruit. Um, we do not grow our own grains or legumes. Uh, well, you know, we grow green beans, but we don't grow our dried beans. Um, most of our dry, dried, uh, most of our dried goods are purchased. Um, we produce our own eggs. We sometimes we're able to actually meet our full community egg eating capacity, and sometimes we're not. This past year, we had a lot of fox pressure, and like three mm. quarters of our flock died, and so we were not able to produce our own eggs at that point. Um, all of our own dairy products are produced here. We have, uh, oh, I'm gonna get this so wrong, but I want to say about twelve cows, um, oh, no. including like five milking mamas currently. Um, and those cows are producing our um, milk. And then we also will kill and eat some cows as is sort of like, you know, necessary within the program, essentially. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can't, you cannot run a dairy program and not also end up with some beef. Uh, yeah. And additionally, with the chicken program, we'll eat usually our young roosters and then keep a couple of roosters for breeding. Cool. Um, and that's, yeah, that's uh, the majority of the food that we produce here. Um, I, I grow some mushrooms here. I grow shiitakes and oysters. And I'm currently working on getting a wine cap bed set up. Nice. Um, and then I'll also go out and forage for a bunch of mushrooms here. And so that, yeah, they, any if there's a mushroom at Twin Oaks, it's from here. Uh. Um, and that's pretty fun. And I do the vast majority of that. Uh, that's yeah, awesome. I wish that we were able to produce our own grains and our own legumes. Um, we do occasionally buy vegetables. We also dumpster a decent amount. Um, and so we'll have a lot of dumpstered produce, uh, dumpstered snack foods, all sorts of stuff like that. And then we also have a relationship with the local food bank where if they have far too much of something and they're going to have to throw it out, they'll call us and we'll come get it. And so in March of 2020, we ended up with two pallets stacked taller than I am of bananas uh, and a ton of blackberries. We had tomatoes. We had just this big stack of food that there was, and you know, it was March of 2020. Everybody's terrified that we're not going to have access uh, or that all sorts of things are going to happen. And so we were aggressively processing all of this stuff. <laughs> right, uh, right. <laughs> and so much banana bread. <laughs> That's um, awesome. We, you know, we still, I think, have frozen bananas from that time. That's ice cream. Um, <laughs> That's tough. Oh, ice cream. Yeah, we've been getting pallets of ice cream uh, recently Whoa. from the bank. They've, uh, their freezer has been on the fritz. And wow. for the last year or so, every so often, we get a pallet of ice cream. And then it's wow. like somebody's responsibility to eat a bunch of ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a hookup. Wow, that's amazing. They're like, yeah, I know so a place cool. with yeah. a lot of people that will actually eat all this ice cream. <laughs> that's amazing. Exactly. Yeah. No, it, it feels great because it's we're able to, and we also, like, when we have excess uh, from our garden that we can't process and put away, we will then give that to the food bank. And so it's really great because we're able to have this reciprocal relationship. And like, I think we're not that connected to the like local Louisa community outside of the intentional communities. 
but that is one of the ways that we're able to have like a reciprocal positive relationship with our neighbors. Nice. That's awesome. And, and so how many acres are there? And then how like how was the land purchased originally? Sure. Okay. So there's about uh there's about five hundred acres. Um it was purchased in a couple sort of separate parcels. Um initially uh we the land was purchased uh i want to say they purchased like two or three hundred two hundred acres maybe um in 1967 um it was money raised by cat kincaid who's the founder of our community and was also also founded uh acorn and founded uh eastwind um and so has just you know a dynamo of community building um, and it was her and a couple of other people who sort of shared her vision, specifically at the time of building a community based on uh, behaviorism, B.F. Skinner's ideology. The community has long since abandoned the vast majority of behaviorism because it's kind of bunk and like low key uh, contributes to like white supremacy culture in a lot of ways. Um, so we're not really trying to do that anymore, but that is the sort of like origin story of the community. Um, basically the idea that, you know, if you give people positive reinforcements and you create the right environment, their behavior will be ideal. And I think that we are still trying to operate on that basic principle while trying to shed a lot of the like icky or baggage associated with that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, hold on one sec. Hey, Mala, did you get my text? Uh, can we do 315 so I can finish this podcast interview? Thanks. <laughs> uh, Mala is here to help me do my laundry because I can't do it right now because I had top surgery two weeks ago and oh, I'm not supposed to lift anything over 10 pounds. Um, that's been amazing healing and community. Um, anyway, right. in terms of, yeah, the land. So originally purchased by a group of people who just decided to pool their money together because this is what they wanted to do. It was an old tobacco farm. And then since then, uh, we've purchased another, I think, three separate parcels, um, including our most recent purchase happened in 2017 of a little section of land that had gotten clear cut a bunch of times that was adjacent to our property. Cool. And we're, we're excited to allow that land to finally, like, heal and regenerate. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, healing and community. Sorry, now I'm just like thinking about that because that's another yeah, huge yeah. benefit. Because, you know, in a normal, like if you lived alone, you would still have to like cook and uh, do your, you know, like you'd still have to provide those things. And that's one of uh, something really awesome uh, about community. It's amazing. I actually, so uh, my ex girlfriend who I'm close friends with was going to come and be my primary caretaker. And then I was going to have be leaning on the community for additional care uh but we had like something came up uh the day before my surgery and i was able to walk across the hall talk to the person who was doing the labor assigning uh wow. and, and she immediately uh got me scheduled people for every single meal got me scheduled an on-call person each day uh for that kind of support and also got me people to like hang out with me and spend time with me all day for the first three days uh, just to, you know, make sure that I'm stable and make sure that I'm doing well. And then since then, I've had somebody assigned uh, for now that I'm able to comfortably like walk and do most things uh, assigned to like walk me up to meals and then somebody assigned to help me with various sort of like lifting and reaching tasks every single day this week. And that's the sort of thing that would fall on a single individual, typically, uh, for like the average person. And that's a lot to ask of somebody. Yeah. And being able to sort of spread that out. And it's right. not really disrupting anybody else's life while I'm also getting all of the care that I need has been incredible. And yeah. uh, all that care time, that's labor creditable. Um, right. Those are all available hours. So people are getting compensated for providing me care right yeah we talked with alpha farm about uh the like you know elderly care too also is a huge one you know mm -hmm. another thing that's hard on one person or hard to afford yeah. or that's like i mean such a huge plus of community that i always think about is like what you're just saying and then yeah is that something that's happening right now there's work hours you can do to care for the elderly um, currently we don't have anybody who requires a bunch of care, oh, okay. uh, but actually in like 2020, 2021, 
Um, we had um, we have this guy. His name was Coyote. He was eighty. Um, he hadn't been taking good care of himself for a while, and then he fell and he broke his hip. Uh, and so after he got back from the hospital, two people stayed and quarantined with him for two weeks, um, and were doing all of his care. And that was entirely overwhelming, just absolutely exhausting for them. And then we were able to spread that care out among a bunch of people. I was one of the people uh, who, like, you know, I was a planner and I was also responsible, usually because the, the planner meetings actually happened in the same building that he was staying in. And so after my planner meeting where I'm making these big community decisions, I would go and I would wipe Coyote's ass. Um, and that was just something that you did. Um, and so being able to spread that out helped a lot. It was still really difficult for us. Um, it required a lot of care. Uh, towards the end, he was pretty ownery. Uh, he kind of had a reputation for being an asshole, but we were able to care for him. And like in when he died in March of 2021, we were all able to get together and be there for his funeral. And we were all just appreciating the fact that he, in 20, in a time when elders were like dying in care facilities, we were mm-hmm. able to get at home, care for him around the people he loved. And then we were yeah. all able to be together to celebrate his life at the end. Yeah. And that was it's really huge. special. It's huge. Huge. I'm glad. Yeah. It's funny. A lot of times when we do these podcasts, uh, it's like, we're so excited to like, uh, have like relate to other communities about like these like similar struggles that we have. And we got a comment on one of the recent ones that was just like, is this trying to convince me not to go to this place or something? I'm like, oh man, I guess we're complaining too much. But now I'm trying to like throw in those little, like, here's all the good things too though. Cause like, it is like, there's so many like challenges like it's it, and I don't want to advertise it as a like oh the utopia lifestyle that's just all better you know like there's so many good parts about it and then there's so many challenges that are like not like something that anyone else is dealing with um so yeah it's just wonderful. yeah and and so just for someone who might be asking himself like is twin oaks for me you know like what what really is like the core values that people like you know align themselves with within twin oaks community I'm going to see if I can pull up our uh, articles of incorporation, which have our core values listed. Um, I'm not sure if I have it on my computer or not. Yep. In fundamental documents, articles of incorporation. Great. Okay. So, or actually our best one is, so technically Twin Oaks is considered a religious organization, despite the fact that we don't actually have any specific uh, religious ideologies here. Um, people are, we have people of various faiths, um, but we hold certain ideologies with the same sort of degree of strength as others will hold their religion. And so our, uh, our principles specifically are that we endeavor to eliminate hierarchy in relationships between people, to practice nonviolence in our personal, interpersonal, and political lives, to respect and preserve the natural environment for the use of our own and other species now and in the future, to eliminate classism, racism, ageism, patriarchy, and other forms of oppression, both in ourselves and in other people, and to practice community of property, sharing all that we have and can produce with one another. And those are sort of like the core set of values of Twin Oaks. And that is basically what we all agree to when we move here as these are the things that we're holding uh people will interpret these in different ways and that can be the source of conflict but in general we all agree that these things are very important and that is our the heart of what we're doing here so i think if somebody's like is twin oaks for me i think the biggest question is do you want structure uh if yes twin oaks is probably the ideal commune for you if not no uh, you could absolutely, like, there are plenty of people who don't enjoy structure, who have a great time, like, coming to stay here for a bit, mm-hmm. uh, guest for a week or a month. But, like, if you don't want a bunch of structure, uh, Twin Oaks is not going to be the place for you. However, what I will also say is that coming to stay at Twin Oaks for a bit is great for people who are trying to start communities, specifically mm-hmm. because we've been around for so long, and people can see our systems and see what they like and what they don't like. 
I mean, I would recommend people go to a bunch of established communities and then a few starting communities as they're trying to start their own. Um, or just like Twin Oaks is also a great sort of launching point for somebody's sort of like communities tour in that Twin Oakers, I think we know more communities uh, as as a community than many because of the communities conference and the other various like community building things that we've been doing for the last 56 years. Um, and so we can also introduce people and make those connections, even if people right off the bat know Twin Oaks is not going to be for them for the long term. Yeah, that's one of the things that's most uh, excited me about Twin Oaks is, is like clearly like a real passion for like the network of uh, spaces, which is something that um, we really like to promote. And even just through doing this has been awesome just to be like, oh, wow, now we have like a little more of an intimate understanding. We know somebody at these different places um which is really cool and also the drew like you know i think i haven't seen any communities that have a so far i don't know that have achieved like producing their own grain and that you know like that's tough but imagining like the 12 if, tribes yeah the 12 tribes are actually the only <laughs> place <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> no, is that it? but they, what yeah. they've actually done it i know i know but <laughs> What they've done they in terms food. of food sustainability, like they have, mm -hmm. and like that, I want to, like, if, you know, to emulate that in the, you know, community network of like where we could actually, mm -hmm. like, if I suddenly got a bunch of money tomorrow, I would buy a bunch of land and we would have a big grain farm with all the insurance. And then imagine, like, it could be like how Eastman gives out that peanut butter. There could be like this yeah. flower <laughs> network, you know, of like that. Um, Fill in your lineage. Yeah, 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 yeah true. That's true. Wow. Well, no, absolutely. Um, LEF does uh, Living Energy Farm. They're actually not okay. so far from us, and they grow all of their own wheat, um, and they make their own sourdough with the wheat that they grow there. Um, they oh, yeah. have amazing sustainability structures. They are not an egalitarian community, and they're not really trying to be, but they are an eco village, um, and their technologies are incredible. So anybody who's trying to set up off-grid stuff and they want to have uh, a sort of like as cushy as possible of an off-grid lifestyle, LEF is a great place to go to like get information about how to set that up. Yeah, I think somebody recommended me that the place. But so it's not real. It's like set up more like a business kind of because you're saying it's not an egalitarian um, community? Not exactly. I mean, it's it's so a family owns the land and okay. they have brought in various people uh members there they have other members the members will stick around for a while sometimes but in general it is more a family and then other people who want to work with that family on their vision and then often go off and do other things using what they've learned there right okay that makes sense that's cool right yeah well great i think you need to go soon right so and, um, pretty soon yeah, yeah. <laughs> two minutes or oh, one minute <laughs> Thank you so I'm much. Do my laundry. For, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. We haven't done our laundry in a long time. We might. Yeah, well, maybe we should go do our laundry too. Yeah, maybe inspire us. <laughs> how, how so, how do people, I mean, we know how to find you online, but how do people find you online and the Oop. whole vibe? You can find me on TikTok and Instagram at, at Jules Amanita, uh, but you can find Twin Oaks on Instagram and Facebook as at Twin Oaks Community. Uh, and we also have a website, which is twinoaks.org. Uh, where we have a bunch of information about everything we do. Um, there's a whole lot more information there that I wasn't able to cover in this process.